Alexander Harris is a clinical research manager at the Kalen Lord Community Health Center in New York, where he specializes in health research and health insurance advocacy for trans and the gender non-binary community. Prior to joining Kalen Lord, he worked at the New York City Health Department, where he coordinated health promotion campaigns intended to shift health narratives for LGBTQ populations and conducted policy analysis around the topic of LGBTQ health. Since 2014, he's organized initiatives to ensure compliance with state and federal mandates for transition-related health coverage, and he frequently provides insurance technical assistance. I can't even speak tonight. Assistance. So with that mouthful, I will introduce Ali. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Corinne, and to the Eastern PA Trans Equity Project. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I always tell folks when we're having these conversations that insurance by nature is very technical. And so I always encourage folks to ask questions when something is unclear. Uh, I also just let folks know that as we go through this conversation that, you know, there are a lot of different ways in which we can navigate these options. I always tell folks that, you know, hang in there with me as long as you can because the information that we have here might give you some information that you haven't had a chance to go through. But also just, again, this is hard. <laughs> By definition, insurance information is, is confusing. Um, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, but we're gonna try to make it a little bit easier today. Um, I always let folks know that just with the caveat that we do have limited time tonight uh, and everyone has a bunch of individual experience we can all learn from in these kinds of conversations. Because this is being recorded, I do advise that, you know, if you do have questions, just throw it in the chat and we can answer them as we go. This by nature is confusing. So as you have things that come up, just feel free to drop it in the chat and we can go through them. Uh, but also just see here, my email is here as well. Uh, just because, uh, you know, some people have personal concerns that come up, I'm happy to answer them as best I can. I also have some guide, guidance documents that are helpful for folks just defining certain terms. So you are going to kind of blow through them tonight. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. So first and foremost, I just let folks know I don't have any potential conflicts of interest. Uh, I don't work for the insurance companies. I don't work for any organization that would be influenced by them. I'm um, here as my own capacity as my, as a, my own person. But I always let folks know that uh, we might refer to things that are off-label use. And what I mean by that, for example, the FDA has not approved uh, hormone, cross-sex hormone therapy for gender, uh, gender dysphoria uh, or, you know, puberty blockers, for example. I always mention that too because, you know, it always comes up. Uh, I also just let folks know that I reference uh, specific insurance companies in this presentation. These are just examples. There's hypotheticals of publicly available policies. They don't reflect any specific benefits termination process. It just is examples to work from. Uh, and also just let folks know that this is just for educational purposes only. Uh, and some folks more over the course of the presentation may talk about their specific experiences. I really encourage that because I think it's helpful for us to all learn from each other. But I also let folks know that Logistically speaking, like these things come up for everyone else. And what's really hard is that people feel very alone in these insurance processes. They feel like they're the only one who's not getting care. And so, you know, you're not alone. We're here together in this. We're not gonna let you move on alone. Uh, I also just remind folks, these views are my own. They don't represent any specific organization, even though I very proudly work for Cal and Lord. I always let folks know it's, it's, it's specifically related to insurance policy information. So here's what we kind of talk about, and first and foremost, uh, today's agenda, which is that, you know, we talk about doing insurance homework. What I mean by this is that how do you get all the information you need to use your insurance to cover care? Um, this can mean getting certain documents in place, uh, talking with certain folks, ensuring the information that you have, no pun intended, is meant to kind of give you everything you need at your disposal to have, uh, you know, go through this process. Um, I'll also go over briefly what it looks like to research provider options, and I say this primarily because you know we when we have when we have these kinds of um, uh, questions, you know, about uh, finding provider, someone who's in network, someone who's out of network, someone who will not contract with insurance, someone who's willing to do a single case agreement. These are all very technical terms in nature, but I just let folks know because we do know that people come into this conversation with very different experiences, and we want to make sure that we can kind of cover the you know our bounds here. Uh, we'll also be going into social support letters. Folks, some folks might think of these as WPATH letters, but the letters that are required in order to get prior authorization for care, pre-certification. 
uh, and what those might look like and why it's important that you're aware of what your insurer may require. May require. Um, getting pre-certification, what I mean by that is the process by which your insurance company would say to your, your surgeon or your provider, and most of them are referring to surgical cases in this instance, um, but let's say you're going to a surgeon, if a surgeon were to ask the insurance company and say, hey, you know, I want to see if I can get this covered, we've met these the burden of medical necessity, this is what's needed, um, and the insurer will come back and say, yes, we'll pre-approve your care, and then basically it's a, it's a, not a promise, but it's basically a, a statement that says that if you bill for this, we will pay for it because we find it medically necessary. It gets a little technical, I'll go into it, don't worry. Uh, also going through the appeals process, this is really, really common. Appeals can happen, you know, between the provider and you never ever talk, and the insurer, and you never talk about it together. Uh, it could be something that you're taking on yourself as a individual. It could also mean you're also working with legal help. Uh, there are a lot of different pieces that you can work with here, uh, but basically it's just, you know, basically saying that, you know, what comes up and how do we get care? Um, and basically, it's proving your case for medical necessity. I'll go into that in a moment, but you'll see. Uh, I also mentioned this bit, last bit too, which I think it doesn't really get talked about a lot in the insurance realm, but getting help and self-care is really essential in this. And what I mean by that is that this, these, these experiences can feel extremely isolating. And the hardest part about that is when you feel like you're doing it alone and you feel like you're doing it in a way that you're not getting proper support or help or you're not necessarily even talking with folks who you know, are able to provide assistance because you keep hitting roadblocks just talking to an insurance agent. So it goes, this goes beyond that and we wanna make sure that folks get the proper help, but also to ensure that folks uh, you know, take care of themselves because this is hard, this is exhausting. And it's not because it has to be, but because this is where our insurance system sit, uh, exists in the present. So, you know, People think that there's like one way to do health insurance. <laughs> there's one way to get this kind, of, this kind of coverage. And I think it's this linear one-step process. Insurance companies will tell you that. The reality is, is what care actually looks like is that it actually looks like a couple of different things. It could mean, you know, different turns, different ways, detours. There are always different options. I always tell folks that there's never one way to get care. Um, People can have different experiences. Every insurer's process is different. Appeals look different for every insurer. Uh, same thing applies to Medicaid and Medicare plans, whether that be you know, a privately administered plan with like what's called a managed care organization or like a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, you know, it really just depends. Um, and these processes have a, a, a general way of what they look like, but it could also just vary a great deal. And so I just let folks know that, you know, the way that you do it is not linear, but it is a way that you can have all of your, you know. Eyes, eyes dotted and your T's crossed in order to ensure that, um, you know, you have everything that you need to get through this process. So I let folks know that when we're thinking about this, the broad scheme of insurance, and I, I, I mentioned this uh, statistic from uh, the national, from, from the, from the, um, the USTS, which is the United States Trans Survey. It's from the National Center for Trans Quality. Equality. Uh, and I mentioned this because I always think it's, a, it's relevant to tell folks, you know, that again, you're not alone via denial. And so, you know, of the respondents, which was, by the way, nearly 28,000 validated responses, and that means like people who were, you know, shown to be people individually responding, um, we knew that one in four, so 25%, uh, are denied coverage in some capacity for gender affirming care. That can be, you know, for surgery, that could be for hormones, blockers, that could be for psychotherapy, it could be for a lot of things that are needed for your care. Um, a lot of common things you'll see are things that are not just about um, health insurance. Um, but they're also about other things as well. But I mentioned this too, because I want to specify things along the lines of, um, I want to mention this because of the folks who, you know, were denied that one, that 25%, you know, 55% of those folks who were denied care were denied because it was a transition related surgery. And that's within the past year. And mind you, this is from 2015 when they collected these data, um, which means that that was kind of the onset of a bunch of things from the Affordable Care Act coming through for folks getting coverage. It also includes information along the lines of uh, folks who um, are now getting coverage. And also I just remind folks that, you know, of folks who sought coverage for medical care. Um, this doesn't count people who paid out of pocket. This doesn't count for people who went, you know, went elsewhere for care, that didn't use their insurance. Um, something to keep in mind. And also I just remind folks too, that uh, all things being said and done, you know, we don't even know from the statistic who actually appealed their coverage denial and got care. So I'm putting it in context and it's mostly just to say, you're not alone if you get denied, you are not alone if you are feeling like you're the only one who is stuck in this place because it does feel isolating, but rather that it's common, expect a denial because that's what happens and doesn't mean that you can't find ways to remedy the situation. So 
going to the point about doing insurance homework, I really encourage folks to, you know, to manage your expectations about what's happening with insurance companies, kind of like what I was saying with that little slide before, but also just to give, you, give yourself the tools you need to get through the first time, ideally, without any trouble. It's a, I'm always amazed when I see that myself, but I always let folks know it can happen and does happen much more and more so often, uh, but also just the information you need to in order to get to proper support. Um, and I also let folks know that, you know, this is formulated based off of mostly private insurance coverage, but a lot of these thing, rules apply to public plans. So for example, managed Medicaid plans, uh, Medicare plans, Medicaid Advantage plans, the appeals process is very similar. The, I guess before, you know, every insurer, every payment mechanism for healthcare has their own process by which they do it. And I'll go into how you find that out. So I always remind folks is that, you know, people, I get this phrase all the time, I have Aetna, I have United Healthcare, I have Cigna, I have Humana, I have Kaiser Permanente, I have a Medicare, I have these various different plans, I have this Medicare Advantage plan, and they think, and X, Y, Z, my friend, my, my family member, someone got coverage. And what I always remind folks is that every plan is not every insurer. So I can have a United Healthcare plan, an Aetna plan, a Cigna plan, a Humana plan, and we could have the, I could, I could have someone next to me who has the exact same insurer, but different policy. Our policies could look entirely different. And it's all dependent based on how that specific policy is defined by the insurance contract. And so, you know, you'll see that some people have certain types of care as a result. It varies a great deal. We'll go into the details in a moment. So real quick, Alexander. So this might be a great time to answer this question. So we have a question from an individual and it says that they've chosen a surgeon for facial feminization surgery that uh, does not accept uh, their insurance. Um, they've looked you know, for surgeons you know, in their network and they're not satisfied with you know, their reputations. So they're gonna need to get reimbursed. They've submitted one appeal and it's been deny denied um, on the grounds of medical necessity. And the mm -hmm. question is, should they hire an attorney with the intent of maximizing any reimbursement? And just before you answer, you know, I know that there are, you can also hire consultants, not necessarily attorneys sometimes that will advocate for you in this. Um, so you may want to think about that. But, um, you know, this is something that we hear a lot, right, about, you know, it's not necessarily medically necessitous for facial surgeries or, you know, tracheal shaves, even top surgeries. Yeah, this is really common. Uh, and I have to say that you will find that feminizing procedures tend to be much more likely to be denied. And part of it has to do with the structure of how insurers believe gender affirming care looks. And by that, I mean, they presume that sex and gender are the same and that sex is determined by, uh, by genitals. And so what you'll see a lot of the time is that you will see that folks will, um, here we go. You'll, sorry that the subtitles aren't working folks, I have my apologies. But what you'll see is that, um, they will say that because FFS isn't part of your genital structure, it's not a part of your chest, they will say like, it's not medically necessary. But the reality is, is that when you go to work every day, you don't show, well, for most, most people who do, who do work in, in an office environment, for example, they don't typically go to work and say like, I'm XYZ gender. And I am also gonna say like, because my genitals are here, like this is the thing. People see people and assume gender based off of other, other things like body structure, facial structures. And insurers don't fundamentally understand that. And even if they do, they don't wanna pay for it. And so that's usually what ends up happening. In terms of surgeons who are in that, I'll get into those details in a moment. I'll kind of go what you're seeing. In terms of hiring someone to maximize reimbursement, this is really tricky because if the insurer does not provide an approval beforehand, that typically means they're not going to cover someone either in or out of network. Um, and there's also things called single case agreements for folks who are out of network. I'll go into that in a moment, but I think it's really relevant when we go into like cost sharing. But um, in terms of hiring someone, I tell folks, I don't hire someone for the purposes of maximizing reimbursement, hire someone for the approval process. And I say that because if you're going to do that, uh, and there's also, by the way, free at no cost, things that are paid for by states, things that are paid for by the federal government that allow you to have that type of support that can go into what's relevant to your specific state in a moment. Um, but I always tell folks that, you know, first and foremost, if there's no approval in place, it really complicates things. And so getting that approval is really essential. But as we go forward, I'll kind of go into the details about medical necessity. I'll go into some of the aspects about reimbursement for out-of-network providers. And I'll also kind of clarify, you know, information about, you know, getting a surgeon who's either in-network or getting someone who is out-of-network and justifying that expense and potentially getting coverage where you're insured to actually pay 
uh, your surgeon directly through what's called a single case agreement. So we'll go into some of these pieces in a moment, but just keep that in mind as we go forward. And this is kind of kind of determining what that kind of conversation is. Yeah, perfect. So Thank the you. first, yeah. So for the first thing, um, uh, as another question here, is it true for health insurance obtained through your employer? Your employer designs the plan that is offered, and they can choose to exclude trans healthcare from coverage. What are they allowed to exclude and not exclude? Gotcha. Okay. So if you have an employer-based plan, there are two types of health insurance options. I'll go into those in a moment, but basically it's how it's funded. There's one where you can buy a pre-made package that has been made by the insurance company, which is called fully funded. And there's one situation that's called self-insured, where basically the, uh, the employer uh, designs benefits based on what they would like to provide coverage for. And as a result, they're basically paying the insurer as what's like a third party administrator to administer the healthcare benefits. And instead of paying for the, the premium, they're paying per procedure. And how those are regulated, which I'll get into in a moment, determines what they can put in the plan and not put in the plan. So I'll get into that in a moment. So if you hold on to your question, I'll answer as we keep going. Perfect. But thank you for the question. So uh, first and foremost, when you're doing your insurance homework, I always tell folks, you know, obtain your benefits information. And there's basically three main documents I let folks know that they really need to see in order to determine what's covered, why it's covered that way, um, and basically kind of outline, you know, what the policy says and why you have coverage through that. And so I always tell folks the first document before you do any type of other homework is getting a copy of what's called your certificate of coverage. And when I say certificate of coverage, what I'm saying by that is could be called like a medical plan or the, the long policy, the policy booklet. There's a lot of different ways that people can talk about this, but this basically defines the contract by which the benefits are actually administered. And so it'll typically say things along the lines of, you know, we cover this thing and this thing and this thing. And those things are usually defined by what kind of policy you're buying, but also it just depends on, you know, what's there. But also folks know that the first thing you want to see when you're thinking about this is you want to look at the exclusion section because that usually determines if you have an exclusion or not for coverage for gender affirming care. Um, you can obtain copies of this. Uh, it basically defines, you know, the plan's benefits, like what actual services are covered. You know, it talks about uh, what services are explicitly excluded, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, appeals processes, and so, you know, what it means, like, when you have a denial, what's the process to appeal that denial? Um, and also what kind of ramifications you can kind of, you know, justify why the denial would look, uh, and also what cost sharing looks like. And what I mean by cost sharing, I'll get into in a moment, but basically it's how much you're financially responsible for in order to finance your care. The ways you can obtain copies, you can obtain them directly through your insurer. Uh, you can get it through the website. You, a lot of these member portals have access to this information. It's not always up to date, so always verify when the policy year was. Um, but I always let folks know you can usually get it through the website. You can also request it over the phone. Uh, and by that, I mean you call the insur you call the uh, the insurance uh, company and you talk to an insurance agent and say, I would like a copy of my benefits. And I recommend for folks to get a copy of it in a PDF format because it's easier to search and it's easier to find the key terms you want. But a lot of them will also just be more old school and they'll give you the, the nice, you know, hundred something page booklet in the mail. Again, I want to save some trees, so definitely, if you can, make sure that you obtain a copy of the PDF. It's just much easier to work with and also easier to share with people who are providing you with assistance. Um, you can also get through your employer directly, the ones who uh, design the benefits to begin with, and you can also get through the health insurance marketplace if you're buying a marketplace plan. What that means is that usually when you log into the, to your, your local health insurance marketplace or healthcare.gov, if you're not in a state that has their own marketplace, uh, that could mean they might have the plans and policies listed elsewhere. A lot of these policies are listed uh, on out to enrolls analysis, and out to enroll is a uh, is a nonprofit organization that looks at these uh, healthcare marketplace plans. And what it does kind of assesses, you know, what kind of coverage exists and how they can advise folks who are choosing a plan and what that might look like. What I let folks know is when you're asking for a copy of this policy, you don't have to say why. A lot of people will say like, I wanna know if I have gender affirming care. I wanna know if I have coverage for the surgery. I wanna know if I have coverage for this type of uh, a puberty blocker. Like you wanna know. The reality is, is that you don't have to explain why that's protected medical information and your employer has no business knowing that because that is for you and for you only. Um, but also more importantly, like a lot of folks are very daunted by this. You do not need to clarify why you're asking for this. You can just say it's part of your benefits pa package. You're entitled to it. So just keep that in mind. Um, I mentioned out to enroll. I'll get into that in a second because I have a resource page we'll go into. But basically it advises folks as to every year what, what uh, healthcare marketplace information might have per plan. They sometimes will rate the plans and let you know what kind of coverage they see based on what they see in these certificates of coverage. Anyway, that was a lot. So we're going to keep going. 
The other benefit uh, information you want to have, so this is a different document. It's called the Summary of Benefits and Coverage. It is different from the Certificate of Coverage, the contract that governs your plan. What it is, is basically is a summary of how your plan's cost sharing works. And it talks about things like co-pays, it talks about co-insurance, deductibles, and maximum out of pocket. This is really important because it lets you know how much you're personally financially responsible for in the event that your care gets covered by insurance. And so what people usually see about this, they think about, you know, I go see my primary care provider and so there's no copay or I see a specialist and there's a copay there. Um, and folks are really accustomed to seeing that in their plans. And so that'll give you an idea of how much like that consult or that fee might be. Usually it's a fixed amount. So if I have a fee, if um, let's say, you know, a cost of a visit is $100 and I'm responsible for a copay of $10 per visit, that's the amount I'm going to pay is that $10 and the insurer will pay $90 for that and that will cover the fee. Co-insurance is a little bit different, but similar to co-pays. It's different in that it is a percentage of the, of the amount that you're paying. So going back to the $100 example, if you're responsible for 20% co-insurance, um, what that means is that uh, in the $100 example, you're responsible for $20 and the insurer will pay 80%. So that's $80. Um, so keep that in mind. Sometimes plans have both and then plans have one or the other. So keep that in mind when you're reviewing this document. The next bit here too is deductibles. Deductibles are the amount that the insurer uh, is expecting you personally to pay before that plan will pay. So in this case, going back to the example of a $100 visit, if your deductible is $1,000 for the year and that's for the policy year. So if it's from like January to December, or if it's from uh, July to June, like there's various reasons why they're structured this way. But something to keep in mind is that that deductible is for that that calendar, that 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 year period for your policy. And so the hundred dollar example, if it's a thousand dollar deductible, and that hundred dollars does not qualify as something that doesn't go towards the deductible, which there's a lot of things that are written about that, um, you'll be responsible for that full hundred dollars, and up until that nine hundred dollar mark. After that, uh, the hundred dollars remaining of the deductible, which basically says that you're financially responsible to pay that thousand dollars up front before your insurance policy will even pay. Um, that looks very different, and it's how it's governed is dependent on your specific contract. And there's maximum out of pocket, which basically this is uh, how much someone will basically be responsible for paying in total for the policy year. So for example, a lot of plans uh, have like a, a maximum out of pocket of like $10,000, $20,000, basically saying how much you would have to pay up front uh, in order for the insurance to pay for everything outright. So basically what it means is that once you hit maximum out of pocket, you don't have to pay for any co-pays anymore. You don't have to pay for co-insurance. The deductible's been fulfilled. You're basically fulfilling all your financial obligations to the insurer. Most folks don't meet this over the course of a year, but if you're having multiple procedures, if you're having multiple types of expensive types of healthcare, you might find yourself re reaching this point sooner rather than later. Um, I see another question here. I'm gonna get into it in a moment because I think that I, I'll go into this kind of how this is defined. And another bit, too, is about the summary of benefits and coverage will also go into information about in-network versus out-of-network. And usually it'll tell you if you have in-network or out-of-network benefits. Uh, most plans will give you the information for both, and they'll say, um, these are like a six to eight page document for most of these types of benefits policies. Sometimes they're a little longer, but they're usually pretty short. Uh, but basically it'll say, you know, if something is in-network, what they'll do is that they will, um, you know, cover the network rate, and they'll have a certain pay payment structure. Same thing with, with uh, out-of-network. If you have out-of-network benefits, with a lot of plans do, a lot of plans don't. So you have to check with your specific insurer. Um, basically what that means is that you're able to see someone out-of-network, but there might be a separate set of benefits that don't apply. So the in-network deductible, the in-network max out-of-pocket, the co-insurance, the co-pays, the one, they'll be defined for the in-network rate, and they'll also be defined for the out-of-network providers. And they're different. Usually the out-of-network is more, and typically the rule of thumb is if you're seeing an out-of-network provider, if they're not doing what's called a single case agreement, uh, you'll be paying more for that care. Okay. And the third document that's really important for your insurance homework is what's called coverage termination guidelines. Sometimes what people will see these be called uh, clinical policy bulletin, the medical policy. A lot of insurers call it different things that are usually available on the insurer's website, especially if you have a membership enrollment portal situation. And I usually let folks know is that this is really helpful for getting an idea of how these things work, why they work the way that they do. Um, and basically what you'll see is that a lot of insurers have their own policies, like a lot of the large commercial insurers like Aetna I mentioned before, um, United Healthcare, Oxford, uh, you name it, like Cigna, all these large insurers typically have their own policy. And it defines the important things you need to know, which is that it tells you which services are covered by your specific, by, by the insurer. And I say this by insurer because there's general policies. Some of those policies are defined by the state in terms of what's required. You'll see that because of a lot of things that changed in California, for example, they have to have a California specific plan. Um, and basically it's a way for them to say like, these are the services that are covered under, under the policy. 
Well, I tell folks though, depending on how your, your benefits are structured, uh, this may not apply to your plan. So a good example, I saw someone posting earlier about Starbucks and uh, I think Apple and a couple of other companies which have different policies. It's because they define their own benefits in a way that meets their needs. And part of that is also defining what services are covered. And so they cover more things because they have contracted it in a way that says we want to cover these things. Um, and so I always tell folks to go to the website and see what the general information is about that insurer to get an idea of what you might be up against uh, if you're going through this process. And also just to look and see generally what the insurer is more likely to cover. But just keep that with a grain of salt that if you work for a different kind of company, they may have different benefits packages available to you. And these policies may not apply. Um, I also let folks know that it will tell you the information of what you need to do to make medical necessity. Typically what that will mean is include information about um, what's covered and what's not, why it's covered that way. It'll say like, you have to have this in a letter. It'll define what the information that's there. It'll tell you all the information that you need to kind of say like, this is what you need. It's like a little checklist. For a lot of things, what you'll see is you'll see like, you have to have documented and and, and uh, persistent gender dysphoria. This is language that's, that's borrowed from the APA through the DSM, which is their own manual for this kind of stuff. And it's also been adapted by WPATH for these letters. Um, and so you'll see a lot of that kind of language. You'll see things that are not actually indicated by WPATH or supported by, um, by the APA, the American Psychological Association. They aren't justified because what will end up happening is that they'll create their own policy. Like you'll see things like cannot be genetically male or cannot be genetically female to get a certain procedure. You'll see language like that. You'll see some really weird stuff that'll come up a lot. Uh, and so something to keep in mind that the language that's used is very unique. They'll also define the codes that are being used. They'll also give some information about why something is covered and not. Uh, and may also have a list specifically of things that are not included in that coverage. Um, you'll see the, the cited sources that they use to justify their policy. You'll see a lot of WPATH standards of care seven. You'll see a lot of DSM reference information or articles that justify why something would be helpful or medically necessary. This something to keep in mind that is also important for you because that also says why they decided to exclude or not or not include something in their policy. So that's something that's also helpful too for the appeals process. But typically when you're looking for these policies, you're looking for treatment for gender dysphoria, you're looking for pupil suppression therapy, you're basically looking for information that's going to kind of talk to you about the benefits as they exist. And if the benefits are usually surgical, they're usually under the gender dysphoria policy. If it's for hormones, there's usually no policy written because usually they apply the same hormone policies that they have for cis folks, like for hormone replacement therapy for folks who are going through menopause or for folks who uh, have low testosterone, it's the same kind of policy. Uh, in terms of surgery, though, it's usually its own gender dysphoria policy. It can be under uh, gender dysphoria procedures. They have a lot of different language that we'll go into in a moment, but something to keep in mind. Okay, so when you get to your specific coverage, so going back to the question before about, you know, can an employer create benefits? And so, yes and no, <laughs> but I always let folks know that you know, you want to look for the exclusion section first and foremost, because that basically says, you know, if there's a categorical exclusion, meaning that they universally don't provide coverage. I let folks know that there are reasons why that's not that's not legal. I'll get into that in a moment. But it's going to keep in mind that you, when you look in the exclusion section, you're going to see if there's no information about gender affirming care, and the language can be really strange, like sex transformation surgery, sex change procedures, like language that we don't typically use in the medical field presently, uh, because again, insurers will write whatever they want to write. Um, if there's no exclusion whatsoever, that means there's coverage. And so if you're looking for a surgical procedure, what that means is that the surgical procedure will be covered under the surgery benefits. So for example, if uh, my surgery benefits, going back to the example of $100 uh, costs and the co-pays and such, let's say I'm responsible for a $5,000 procedure, that $5,000 procedure will apply to all the, the ways that surgery benefits are, or basically outpatient procedures or inpatient, however they frame it, that's what's going to apply to in your policy. So you can think about that. What's really rare, but you see a little bit more often nowadays, but it's really not common, if it's explicitly written to policy that we provide gender affirming care, again, it's extremely rare and typically it's based off of most self-insured plans that folks explicitly write in. Examples include, uh, can include things like, you know, those, those unique policies. Um, that usually means that there's coverage. It doesn't necessarily say what that coverage means or how it applies, but something to keep in mind. Uh, when it comes down to language, if it doesn't, if it exists and there's an explicit exclusion, usually that means there isn't coverage for the policy. But that being said, don't be bereft just yet. It's very, it's very exciting to see this. You can still get covered. And when I say by that, you can still get covered. There are appeals processes. There are things you can do to get coverage. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that, but you can still fight your insurer to get coverage. That is medically necessary care. So while we're kind of at a pause here, so one of the questions was, what if my 
options in my policy is that you know they're silent on trans care, which I think you're back on that prior slide was you know the first one, right? So there's no information yep. at all means that they're not excluding co coverage, and that means mm -hmm. our coverage. I know that for myself, that's frankly, you know, they didn't mention trans healthcare at all in, in my certificate of coverage, and I'm going like, oh my god, I'm you know screwed. But then lo and behold, they cover it at all. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if it's silent, typically that means that there is no explicitly include coverage. Um, but what I say by that, I mean, is that it just means that it's not, it's not excluded, which means that there is coverage. It's very confusing. It's what happens. Silence usually is a good thing in this instance because uh, it means that there's coverage. But again, it really depends on what you're trying to get covered. Just yeah. to keep in mind. And, and you might, here, oh, here's oh, an oh, interesting oh. question. Somebody said, so how do I make sure they don't drop me when I change my gender? So I'm, I'm assuming that they mean that once you have surgery, how do you make sure that they don't drop you? Legally, they can't. Yeah. Legally, they can't. And there's reasons for that. Uh, part of it is that the ACA, which is the Affordable Care Act, uh, some people know it as the Obama Care, have certain protections that say they can't, they, it, it's considered to be like, um, it's healthcare discrimination. You can file a complaint against your insurer. Usually when people get dropped, it's just because they didn't uh, pay their premium if they're paying for a self-insured plan or for a plan that they're paying for the marketplace. Um, but not based on gender, that's, that's sex discrimination. It's very clear, it's well-documented and there are so many reasons why that is so messed up, but also not going likely going to happen. But if yeah. it does, that's when you get legal help. Good. And so, and maybe this is, I'm guessing this is in your next section where you're gonna be talking about appeals. But uh, one person said that they had, uh, they were denied care or denied coverage, I should say, um, with you know, specific procedure codes. But they said the letter was vague and it didn't include any checklists. And this gets back to this whole certificate code. You need to get, don't be satisfied with a little one or two page summary document. You want the big document. Yeah. And so when it comes to vague language in those types of terms, those are called determination letters. It's usually for a pre-certification. When you have that, they'll say it's not medically necessary. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Typically underneath that, they'll say something like, you know, this is cosmetic. They'll say something along the lines of did not meet the criteria for, for coverage. But there's, there's some things. The challenge that comes up is, is kind of the, the sleuthing that like, you think of it as like a Sherlock Holmes situation where basically you've got to figure out why they denied it. It's not always explicitly clear. It's something to keep in mind that, you know, it's not always going to be obvious. And this is when you ask for folks who provide this, this type of uh, assistance with the appeals processes, they can kind of help you kind of figure out what that kind of information exists. Um, and going back to another question that I see here too, is that is there still sufficient coverage for self-funded plans? Absolutely, because you have every insurance policy, whether it is self-funded or fully funded, um, it has to have a, a document that governs what is covered and what's not, so yes. But going back to the question of vague language and questions and such, you're gonna see that a lot in letters, if that happens, you can feel free to reach out to me directly, but also there are definitely health insurance advocates in, your, in every state that can help with this process too. And many of them are paid for by state tax dollars. So I highly encourage folks to reach out to those resources. They've become much better at this in the course of the time since these uh, healthcare protections went into effect. So going back to the kind of the insurance homework, we're gonna review the summary of benefits. Again, we're gonna get an idea of how much we're gonna be responsible financially. A lot of cases, you know, you might have to pay for the cost of the outpatient surgery. You might have to pay for the cost of the hospital stay. Sometimes there's a, there's a cost with the anesthesiologist. And I just caveat there, a lot of times you'll find that anesthesiologists, they don't coordinate them with the hospital or the surgical center to be in network with your insurance. It happens a lot. Um, there are ways you can fight that, but just keep in mind, it might come up. Um, Keep in mind things like co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles, maximum out of pocket, you know, these things will apply. Uh, and going back to that in-network versus out-of-network piece. So this is really, really important. So the benefits of in-network are much easier and simpler for folks to understand in terms of cost sharing. And why I say by that, like it's easy to understand like a percentage of the cost is gonna be your responsibility. Um, and by percentage of the cost, that has to do with what's called UCR, UMR. It's what's reasonable and customary, usable, customary, reasonable. There's a lot of these, all these different language pieces and usually it's defined based off of like where Medicare sits. And I say Medicare because that's usually the national regulatory like baseline where things are, are covered. And that's varying based on location. So the rate you're gonna get for New York City is gonna look very different from Topeka, Kansas. It's gonna look very different from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's gonna look very different from Seattle. You know, these things are all gonna vary because there's a higher cost of living which means the cost for the procedure is gonna be higher. And so they'll have a higher reimbursement. It's not that much, don't worry, not whether really I say that, but it's something to keep in mind. And so in network, you're not gonna see those costs. You're just gonna see the amount that you're responsible for. And so if it's a percentage of the cost, like here, uh, I always recommend to folks, you know, ask your provider how much the cost is that's being covered. 
and that they'll be able to give you an estimate. Usually they don't know until they actually file with the insurer exactly how much they're going to get back and how much you'll be financially responsible for. So they keep in mind, it's, it's something that really throws people off. Um, when it comes to out of network though, I always encourage folks to think through this as saying that when you have providers who are out of network, you have to pay that upfront cost ahead of time typically, uh, or you get a single case agreement. The reality is, is that when people get something to get for reimbursement, a challenge that a lot of people find out is that they're not being given when they're being reimbursed, if they're presuming that they get reimbursement. I always remind folks, it's the amount of the reasonable and customary, not the amount of surgical charges. So let's say going up that $5,000 surgical procedure example, I always give a lot. Um, in that case, if you go see someone out of network, let's say that surgeon typically charges their, their patients $10,000 for the same procedure, but the insurance company only pays $5,000, whatever that arrangement is, like the deductible, everything else will apply. So if I have, you know, a hundred dollar deductible for out of network, I'm going to pay that. If I have the cost of the policy or if I have the cost of the, the co-pays or deductibles, like that's all of consideration. Uh, but also like it's of the rate that's the standard rate. It's not off the rate with the surgeon charges. So I'm not going to get that full five, that total $10,000 back. It'd be of the $5,000 they're going to pay for their standard rate. And then whatever I'm responsible for outside of that. So you could still be on the hook for a decent amount of money. Um, so, and that's, that being said, and that being said, when we think about this, I always encourage folks to rem remember if, if an insurer says like you can get the service ahead of time and then get reimbursed, that doesn't always work out unless you have a determination ahead of time that basically says you can get coverage or not. And so what a lot of people end up doing is they try to get coverage. They don't get a pre-certification done. There's no guarantee or there's no, there's no clear indication that you're going to have coverage. So even if you're seeing an ad network provider, work with your surgeon and say, like, I really need you to pre-certify this. Otherwise, I will have no reimbursement possibility afterward. And a lot of surgeons who don't accept insurance are not wanting to budge on this, but push them because it's really, really important. So next thing is reviewing the coverage determination guidelines, the clinical policy bullets, and whatever the language that the insurer uses to show how the benefits are run. Uh, review the services that are covered, those that are excluded. Review the required criteria of what you need to provide medical necessity. Typically, that's like a diagnosis code, usually related to gender dysphoria, which is typically F64.0. You don't need to remember that. Your surgeon will likely have that information. Um, you need to know the number of letters required. So for example, uh, a good example is New York State Medicaid. No matter what procedure you're having, you have to have two letters that show that it's medically necessary. Um, usually, WPATH recommends that for something like top surgery, whether that is removal or augmentation, the reality is, is that that's usually one letter. Medicaid still requires two, no matter what. And so I always recommend to folks to remember that it's based on what the insurer requires, not based on what WPATH requires. Keep that in mind. It also tells you what, what needs to be physically covered in the, in the letter. So that could be like a history of like, you know, when you first experienced gender dysphoria, it could be, um, you know, when someone has a different procedure, there's a lot of these different pieces, you know, amount of time on hormones is really common. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Also the credentials of the writers. So, you know, if you're seeing a therapist, if you're seeing a psychiatrist, they might define what type of providers you need to see in order to actually get coverage. So that can be really confusing. It happens a lot. Always go based on what default to what the insurer usually expects. And that's usually the best policy for these things. Yeah, I think that's a really important thing is like, you know, I know it's one of the things that, you know, I often counsel people, right, is that this is compli complicated, it's complex, and it's time consuming. Um, and, you know, many folks want to move quickly. And, and while I understand that, it's also important that, you know, that, you know, based on, you know, how much you're willing to pay and, you know, what risks you want to take, you know, sometimes taking that step back and doing that extra bit of research is going to really pay off for you down the road. Yeah. And I just tell folks, it's always really important to look at these details because this can really save you some headaches later on. And I, it's really hard to anticipate all these headaches because there are so many that can happen. Uh, but this is just a way to make things easier on yourself and just make sure that you've, you know, again, dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Think of it as just a, a horrendous bureaucratic process that you need to follow. Um, and then, and while, yeah. while, we're on, while we're on this, and I think this kind of mm -hmm. gets to some of this, right? So there's a question, is a follow-up around um, your conversation earlier about uh, advocates that might work for the state, for example, uh, around get, helping you get coverage or define coverage. Um, and the question was, is this, do you reach out to somebody in your state of residence, in the state in which you work, or the state in which the policy is written? So maybe you live in New Jersey, you work in New York, and the company is based in Texas. Yes. Uh, when you get help, you get help from the state of residence. And I say that because um, usually those benefit programs are based on where you're paying tax dollars, so to speak. 
And if you're a resident, so for example, I'm a resident of New York. I used to work for a company that had their insurance benefits through Massachusetts. Uh, if I were to appeal a claim, I wouldn't contact the Massachusetts Department of Health. I would contact my local Department of Health because they're the ones that are regulating the process for external appeals. When you get external appeals, it's done on a state level. Uh, even if you're like using Medicare or another federal plan, those external processes are assigned based off of your local insurance department typically, because that's the state in which you reside. Therefore, that's the jurisdiction you're getting care. It's complicated. The point is, is that like you have to go based on the state in which you're residing in, because that's typically where your, your, your benefits come from, from uh, the tax dollar paid pieces. In terms of appealing, I always recommend going to your local state insurance uh, regulatory agency. So in New York State, it's DFS, which is the Department of Financial Services. Um, and usually those are the folks who have the experience with the po policies. They don't regulate all policies, which you'll see in a moment, um, but that's where I would go to first. Great, thanks. Okay, so, so now I know what my coverage looks like. How do I get my care approved? And this can be really concerning and, and confusing. Uh, you know, the misnomer is, is that if you have coverage, you'll definitely be approved. Um, determination for coverage, I let folks know it's not based on what your insurance contract says. It's not based off of, you know, this coverage termination guideline I mentioned before. It's based off of the pre-certification process. And I tell folks, you don't know if something is approved unless you know, which is provider pre-certification. And what I say by that is that the actual process that when your surgeon, your provider, whoever it may be, is seeing if they can get coverage for your care, it's when they contact the insurer, they talk with someone using their uh, pre-certification department. The conversation is, I wanna provide the service. The service is this, and this is how the service is medically necessary and justified based on the criteria that's by the insurer. The insurer then tells you if it's a yes or a no, and you go from there. Um, a lot of people stop before this point. And I think this is really, really challenging for a lot of people because they assume that you know if they're told over the phone, like even if coverage doesn't mean anything. The pre-certification is only the determination that you want to work from. And so knowing who your surgeon is, knowing what your insurer is and what your expectations are, if you have coverage or not have coverage, the pre-certification is going to basically say, if you have a denial, if you have an approval, that's the only way you're going to know. Only use that as your main step because otherwise you're going to be running. It's like a dog chasing its tail. The reality is, is that if you don't know, you don't know, it's going to be a lot of back and forth. Always go off of the hard decision that's made by the insurance company. So restricted provider options I mentioned before about in-network, out-of-network. I'm gonna go through this very quickly because I know we're running low on time. But just now more than ever, healthcare providers are accepting insurance for this type of care and they are in-network with a lot of different insurance carriers. Uh, logistically speaking, for folks who are in-network, um, usually uh, most surgeons are aware of what each insurer requires. But again, if you have a different type of policy that's governed by like your company, maybe they have a more um, progressive or more inclusive benefits package that exists, um, it, they may make assumptions. And so they might, so a surgeon might, you know, tell you they never provide coverage for this. They might not, but your plan might be different. Always go default to what the, uh, your specific plan involves, but a lot of surgeons actually know, but some don't, they might misguide some folks on occasion. Well, just simply speaking, this is a great way to minimize your out-of-pocket costs because you're only responsible for the in-network rates and you're only responsible for your cost sharing there. It also, it also really simplifies financial planning. I'm able to like throw in, like if I have this many co-pays in a year, if I have this many cost sharing pieces in a year, I, I can anticipate that. Um, whereas when you go out of network, it becomes much more confusing. There is this note, which I think is really important that a lot of folks don't know, is that even if you have an out-of-network provider, you can get what's called an in-network exception. And it's also called a GAF extension exception. But basically, it's a, a way that you can create a one-time agreement with the insurer and the surgeon um, how to get coverage. And so basically, it's meant to compensate for gaps for what's called network insufficiency. What this means is that there's no provider in network who offers this service, and therefore I'm going to find someone else who does and is willing to, to accept my insurance payment and create a contract with that insurer. And typically they'll define what that's involved. And what that looks like is that basically you're able to get coverage at the in-network rates, you're able to get coverage at, at the in-network cost sharing. It's really, really helpful for folks, especially for providers who don't typically accept insurance or are not contracted with the insurer. Um, which is a lot with a lot of Kaiser plans. I know with a lot of folks who are in states with not minimum of surgeons who are there. Um, but it's a really helpful tool that your surgeon can basically say like, hey, uh, I want to get this thing covered for this patient. I'm not a network provider, but there aren't any network providers. Sometimes the insurer will come back and say like there are, and these are the people. And they need to prove why they aren't, why they aren't good options. That's a really good example for things like genital procedures or for um, facial feminization or facial masculinization. It comes up a lot. Uh, something to keep in mind. It just comes up all, all the time. So, but just again, this is a really great tool, especially for folks who are who have that. 
Uh, the other thing to keep in mind too is that if you have out of network benefits, this is very hard to get. And so you typically that means that you can't get this and you have to go and use your out of network benefit plans. It's not, it's, it's, it's one of like the trade offs like you can with out of network benefits is that you don't always know what that could entail. And this is the next bit about out of network claims and reimbursement. You know, there may be certain to network with your plan, out of network benefits might, you know, might compensate. Um, it allows for more flexibility with providers because you have a little bit more choice, but that means that you are likely to pay more as a result. Um, the in-network maximum out-of-pocket expenses will not apply in this case. There might be a separate maximum out-of-pocket for your out-of-network benefits, and you could potentially be on the hook for the entirety of the cost of your care. It's messy, and it's there's just a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you know, many services who do not accept insurance will provide pre-certification for, or will not provide pre-certification for these services. I see a lot, particularly for things like top surgeries. It's a, it's a, it's a big issue. Um, and for surgeons who just don't accept insurance, I always recommend to folks that, you know, if this happens, always ask your primary care provider or your hormone prescriber to issue the, the pre-certification request. And the reason being is that if you're seeing someone out of network again, I highly recommend you know, many insurance companies require that pre-certification that's even for out-of-network claims. Don't just go in blindly and pay for it up front and expect for it to be covered without that without that pre-certification. It creates so many messes. It's going to create so many headaches. So if you can, get that pre-certification when possible. And if you if you don't know if you can uh, or if you don't know, just expect what would happen if I paid for the full cost of care in the event I didn't get reimbursed. And so that's a really hard thing for a lot of folks to stomach. But just, again, emphasizing that's the case. If that surgeon's willing to do a pre-certification and accept a single case agreement, that's the ideal circumstance for an out of provider. Social support letters. I know we're running lower on time. I apologize, everyone. Uh, I have examples I usually use. So there's an example that I see Christine McGinn, for example, who's based out of uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania. I know that she has a very specific protocol in which, which she requires in the letter, and that's, those are defined by the surgeon. But the insurer might have their own requirements, which is typically the case. Uh, so, for example, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield is something that I'm sure that I've had a, 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 over the course of time at some point. I don't have them now, but they have their own policy and plan what they require. And so the point is that the surgeon might have different requirements than the, um, than the insurance company. And so when in doubt, always default to the insurance company is usually more restrictive and always make sure that you include all the requirements that a surgeon may require. So in this case, that allows you to find like how many letters are required, what has to be listed in the letters, usually it's like health history, other anything relevant information, prior procedures, hormone use. You see things about how someone uh, started, um, like when someone started hormones, when someone started blockers, when someone had a certain social or legal intervention, these things come up. Uh, I usually tell folks, err on the side of less is more. Um, don't give the insurer something to run away with and deny you care. Just give the very base amounts and you can guide your, in, you can guide your, um, your letter writers and provide them with the information from the uh, from your um, coverage termination by guidelines. So if your insurer has a specific criteria that they're required, give it to your letter writers so they know what they're supposed to write and so they know what to include. Um, you'll also get information about the patient provider relationship, the amount of time that you're in that person's care. Some insurers have certain requirements for therapy. It is messy. When in doubt, you can always move beyond that, but it's challenging in many ways, but there are ways to do it. Uh, and usually, again, um, for fulfilling the insurer's criteria, you typically have to have a diagnosis, and that diagnosis typically is gender dysphoria. You'll also see other language that's being used based on the ICD-10, which is the coding system for diagnosis. Um, and what you'll see typically is that they have other language that maybe that you're not accustomed, always default to, again, the F64.0 code, which is just, it, now it's listed as gender identity disorder. It's language that is not applying. When they updated the ICD-10 from ICD-9, they didn't take the language that they got with that, so just take it with a grain of salt. So when you're at the point of getting pre-certification, you want to go through your own personal checklist regardless of what the insurer offers. So again, you want to make sure that you've confirmed what your benefits are. You want to make sure that the surgeon that you selected uh, either takes the insurance or you have a single case agreement option with them, or they're going to be filing for you, or you know that you're going to be paying up front and getting reimbursed. Uh, letters are ready to go before your pre-certification request goes through. And when I say that, typically what that means is that you're processing letters and it's upfront. Uh, so what happens is that the provider requests pre-certification. When that happens, that'll mean that you get an approval or a denial. And so that's usually made when a healthcare provider submits all the documentation required uh, and usually submits to the insurer. The insurer will read the information, make sure it's all there, that you have all the medical necessity documentation, and that's it. Um, once the insurer has made a decision whether that's an approval or denial, uh, the insurer is required to issue a written document and this shows the determination. I remind folks that when we have these type of conversations, those language pieces can be very vague. There are ways around it. 
And when something's approved, you'll get the approval letter with the case number, you'll get the information about the window of time in which it's active. Usually uh, a surgeon will have the date of surgery as being the window of time. That can be moved. So once you already have the approval, you can still move that in the, in the future if you have to. And a lot of, what a lot of surgeons do who are really accustomed to these insurance processes is that they will actually give you um, an arbitrary date and they'll basically say, okay, so is there an approval? And then they'll move the date to your actual surgery date. So for example, for a lot of folks who maybe are getting a pre-certification process starting in January, but their procedure isn't until October, they might say, because they'll limit the amount of time, it's a 60 day window in which they'll actually provide the approval. Um, they'll provide a date and they'll just move the date to a later date time. If there's a denial, um, I always let folks, remind folks that, you know, you get a letter confirming the denial, you'll get a case number associated with that denial. Uh, you'll get an explanation, even if the explanation is not particularly good. <laughs> And you'll also get information about your appeals rights process. And that'll typically let you know like what state you're supposed to do the appeals process through and what internal and external appeals processes you have to do. Um, and what I always recommend to folks, generally speaking, is that um, you know, the coverage termination guideline usually gives you that kind of information, like that little checklist of things you're supposed to have. I always recommend defaulting on that. Uh, sometimes the insurer will give it to you uh, their own policy that is, is specifically to your policy. You can request that, that is not a problem, but you basically have to understand like why they made the termination the way they did. So the appeals process, which is never the fun part. Uh, so common reasons for the denials, we see the exclusion, which we went over before, the certificate of coverage, so making sure that information is there. You'll also see coverage caps. This is illegal based on the ACA, and also exclusions technically are illegal based on the ACA and labor laws, which I'll go into in a moment. Um, you see narrow medical policies. So for example, we only cover genital surgeries, or we only cover this one procedure. We only cover this type of hormone. You'll see that a lot. It's very narrow. And then what they're doing is you're trying to avoid paying for other procedures. Um, they may also say that your medical necessity criteria have not been met, which could mean that um, there are certain requirements for your specific policy that are going to say, like, in order to get coverage, you have to do this thing. Um, and then you might before, like with letters, that's usually how you document those pieces. And the surgeon who is advocating for your pre-certification process will kind of give you that kind of information. You'll also see information along like sex-specific procedures. You'll see a lot of this for things like, you know, pap smears, PSA testing, um, uh, prostate screens of some variety, things that are considered to be like sex specific in terms of like what the anatomy that they presume is to be a thing. Uh, so you'll see a lot of like, say like, you know, if my gender marker is M and I'm trying to get a pap smear, I might get denied because it might say that like, because I have an M gender marker, they're not gonna cover it. it is a horrible arbitrary process. You can basically threaten them and say like, hey, like, you know, you can't do this legally. Yeah, 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 don't threaten anyone. But the point is that you can have that conversation. Um, there's also non-binary non identities that's come up a lot. And what I usually recommend to folks is that you avoid identity language in your documents. Um, if possible, you just say like, you know, someone identifies this way, you can have that. But a lot of insurance uh, folks who are reviewing these, these, these pre-certifications, they don't, they're not familiar with this language, not familiar with this terminology. So that people get caught up a lot, a lot in that. And because you'll see a lot of these policies are written in a way that shows a policy for a specific, um, like, if it's for people who are transitioning towards male, people who are transitioning towards female, you see a lot of this language, it's antiquated, it doesn't make any sense, but they do it that way again to limit care. Uh, you'll also see limitations for minors. Like a lot of the policies will say, we don't provide surgical coverage for folks who are under the age of 18. And that's there's a lot of reasons for that, but you can still, again, appeal that. It just gets really messy. Network adequacy, which you'll see a lot, which is that there's not a provider in network and so you have to prove to them that, that any of the folks that they have in network aren't sufficient. And you'll also see folks who have in their policies the definition of what cosmetic is, and then that happens a lot, especially for things like FFS, breast augmentation, um, people who are getting um, uh, contouring procedures. You'll also see for folks who are doing things like Brazilian butt lifts and that kind of thing, you know, uh, filler removal. You'll see a lot of this type of stuff that happens a lot. Um, hair removal is also a big one too. And so a lot of this comes up a lot over the course of this, and it's not legal, but they still do it anyway because they can get away with it, but you can make them cover your care. So when I tell folks what the appeals process looks like, usually you get the initial denial, you'll list your appeal rights. It'll also list you know, any community health advocacy organizations that are able to help you do the appeal. Uh, there's something called an internal appeal process, which is basically when you're working directly with the insurer, you're basically saying, hi insurer, I wanna make sure that I get this covered. This is why you write them a letter. Um, sometimes you can do something that's called a peer to peer, which is when the provider actually issues that uh, initial appeal and they can appeal for you. Usually you have to sign over documentation that says you're willing to do it that way. And typically the rule of thumb is that if you're doing an appeal, especially in the first appeal, the internal appeal, usually you have 60 days notice to actually put that through. Uh, and that's because it's like they give you a window which you can appeal. If you miss that window, you have to do the pre-certification process over again. Okay. And 
also, you know, there can be multiple levels of internal appeals. Some of them have one level, most of them have at least two. I've seen up until four levels of approval processes. Um, but the point is that you, when you, ex you, the idea is that you want to exhaust your internal appeals. Hopefully by the time you hit that, you exhaust your internal appeals, you don't have to do this process, but hopefully they'll finally, they'll, they'll do it, but you're going to receive something called a final adverse determination. And what this means is that it is going to be letters saying, we're not covering it. You've exhausted your appeals. You can't do anything else. But the reality is you can do something what's called an external appeal, which basically you're working with independent review organization. And what they do is it's an external agent who's going to basically say, I see all this coverage. I see all of the arguments that were being made for, to provide coverage, and they're going to make a determination whether or not you're going to be able to get coverage. Generally speaking, um, I've seen most folks when they're going through the appeals process and they're arguing with their insurer, most of these things happen in the external appeals process. So I always tell folks, if you're going through internal appeals, just keep in mind that a lot of times insurers are going to stay, stand their ground as best they can because they're expecting you to give up. And that's when you go to the external appeals process and you really, really try through there because you're basically saying, I'm not the, you're basically saying someone who's not the insurer and you're basically saying, this needs to be covered and this is why, this is compliant with current, you know, medical necessary standards of care for WPATH. Like there's a lot of different reasons why you provide coverage, but that's usually where you win. And that's usually where you get other folks involved like legal assistance, I'll go to that in a moment, but something to keep in mind. I know we have a very little time. So when you're, this when you're going for the external appeal and you say, you mm -hmm. know, an independent review organization, is that an organization in your state? Is that a governmental body? What is that? Uh, so uh, when I mentioned before, when we we're talking before, I remember someone, there was a comment about who do you get legal help from if, or who do you appeal to, like what organization, yada, 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 right? Um, usually it's the state in which you reside in because usually that local department of insurance will make the determination for you. So uh, in my case, like if I have, even if I have a self-insured or a fully funded plan, doesn't matter. The reality is, is that you have the, the, the right to do so. And it's doing it so in the state in which you reside. Um, some uh, internal or external reviewers are better than others. It, there's no real, it's hit or miss. And I can't say, you know, what someone's going to get in a certain state. What I do say, though, for folks is that um, if you work with someone who is uh, legal counsel, which again can be funded by your state and you don't have to pay for, um, that's a great way to kind of go through that process and get you to that point. Um, but that generally it's the state in which you reside. Sometimes there's other types of um, processes, so just keep that in mind. Everything that you need in terms of information will be listed in your initial denial letter. So, for example, when I get a denial letter, it shows, you know, the service is denied, and then it will say after that, um, it was denied for this reason, and here are the people that you go to for assistance if you're filing an external appeal, because they are required to inform you of your rights as through the appeals process, always default to whatever that organization is for assistance. In my case, it always defaults to a certain organization that provides that type of assistance. This is what happens, usually they're contracted by the state, but again, it typically the rule of thumb is the state you reside. Great, so, so that'll be listed in your denial letter. Yes, your organization exactly. to go to. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mentioned before what's been called a peer-to-peer. -peer. I know that we're running. I, if it's okay, uh, Corinne, can we go a little over time? Okay. Lovely. Um, provider appeals. What this means is basically that a provider contacts your insurer on your behalf and says, this denial was issued an error. I'm going to say like, you know, in most instances, like I, you know, they have their own appeal process. Um, but a peer-to-peer -peer basically, you know, the surgeon usually talks with a nurse or another doctor who works for the insurance company. They explain why it should be covered. A lot of times when they do that, it allows you to uh, get that taken care of right away. There are a lot of times where you will see that. Uh, you'll get a denial letter, but you've already found it has been approved because the doctor usually does the appeals process for you in that way. They're limited in what they can do. And a lot of times if they're doing it for you, it usually means that they have to get a signed letter that says like, you're going to let me do the appeal for you, et cetera. Uh, but most providers don't do the appeals process for you. They'll usually stop at the peer-to-peer -peer and help folks uh, say, like, you know, you have to appeal the appeal process, and they might give them some guidance. A lot of folks get stuck with this, um, so it comes up. Um, I also folks know, too, is that, you know, appeals can be started prior to obtaining care. Um, and what I usually recommend to folks is that, you know, after the denial, go through that process as fast as you can, but, you know, it does take time. Um, depending on the jurisdiction of the insurance is regulated, you know, providers can conduct potentially internal or external appeals for you, but typically they don't. It's usually, it's a very exhaustive process. It is hard to do, and, and a lot of places just don't do it. So just keep that in mind that, you're, that you might be doing it on your own, but there's always assistance to help. In some instances, the, uh, providers might refer to you to a local community health advocacy. I know that in New York State, in New York City specifically, uh, there's like community health advocates, which is an organization that is contracted by CSSNY. They usually file the external appeals for folks who are privately insured. Uh, for folks who have Medicaid in New York City, we usually have folks do what's called a fair hearing, and they usually work with our legal aid organization that's local to here. 
So depending on what your, um, your financial level is, you might have different access options. So what should you say in your appeal? My provider already said that my care is medically necessary. Again, what does medically necessary mean? And so again, you're gonna to need to create some type of letter. The letter is gonna say such that you're gonna describe the procedure that you're getting. It's gonna tell you why you've been denied. And you're gonna explain that, you know, why the procedure is medically necessary to treat gender dysphoria. And I usually default to saying gender dysphoria. You know, it's a little confusing for some people, but always default to that. And you'll have to explain why the procedure um, meets your, for your specific reasons, why it's medically necessary for you. And that can be a little invasive, but I always tell folks you have to explain why. And if you're working with legal help, they'll tell you as much and as little as you need to provide to provide types of information. But typically you'll have to go back to why the insurer specifically is describing, is providing coverage or not providing coverage. And a lot of times you'll see things like something as cosmetic, you can appeal that too, don't worry. Uh, and you'll see a lot of reasons why. Um, and you know, reasons why they might have erred in their, in why they haven't provided coverage. So they basically, they can't deny care because it's cosmetic. They can't ignore the evidence of the field. The procedure is so a good example with like body contour. There's not a lot of medical evidence that would show why it's covered, but you can basically use the current arguments. And there's some great resources I can, I'll show at the end uh, of what you can get that information for. You'll also see that they might have ignored evidence that you had submitted previously. Um, they might have violated local trans health protections by erring against, by, by, by giving you the wrong uh, coverage termination. And there might be additional L evidence. So that could be an example of like, you know, uh, maybe your provider who's a specialist in, in the field says like, this is, I have, other, I have other patients who get this and therefore it's medically necessary. This is why, et cetera, et cetera. So go back to the example of FFS. Um, you know, again, like in someone's daily life, people are seeing your gender presentation and gender expression typically through things that they can see, which, you know, not so much with, with all the masking right now, but presently. Um, but basically, if people see that in your data and your work in the way that you interact with people, that could be a reason to provide coverage. That's how people are reading your gender, and that's what's causing you dysphoria. There's ways you can frame that. I'm doing it in a very, you know, anecdotal, like colloquial kind of way, but there are ways you can put that up in your letter. And again, that letter is the determination factor, determining factor of why. But sometimes they want clinical evidence. Sometimes they're just not going to care, and they're just going to keep denying you. That's when the external appeal is helpful. But just again, make sure you want to basically say what the procedure is. You want to say why it's medically necessary to treat gender dysphoria. You want to explain why in your specific case you want it covered. And you want to also say why they erred in, in, in denying coverage. And for this, I typically work with like study passengers of care. The standards of care eight will probably have more information about this, I hope, um, whenever it does come out. Uh, but just keep in mind that when this does come up, it, these are the things people are thinking about when they're trying to get that clinical evidence. Documents to submit with appeals, that's the initial appeal letter. The, that's the explanation why you need to make the case for surgery. Uh, all documents that were submitted with the initial request for coverage. Uh, any secondary letters of support from providers, that could mean like your, your hormone prescriber is writing you a letter saying this is medically necessary, something like that. Um, citations from, uh, you know, medical society. So for example, study passage of, of standards of care seven, soon to be eight, whenever that comes out, um, they'll kind of go over why something is covered or, or what procedures are medically necessary. Um, they might not provide a lot of evidence, but they might provide the citations as to why. Um, and the Endocrine Society, for example, like, you know, a good example that comes to mind is uh, they go over like what hormones can and cannot do, and therefore surgery is necessary to correct that. Um, other things you can also include are things like relevant sections from the insurance company, insurance policy documents that could be like, there's no, like you can say like in the exclusions, there's no exclusion that says that, that, necessary, that, this, that this care isn't covered. Uh, it could also show that, um, your coverage termination guideline says that this is uh, cosmetic, but you can say like, you don't provide any clinical evidence for why it's cosmetic. And therefore you're saying like you made this based on arbitrary judgment. You can also include information about trans health care protections. And when I say that we're talking about trans health insurance bulletins that are in various states, we're talking about the ACA's coverage, section 1557, which is the non-discrimination clause and state and municipal human rights law. You can use all of these things to say, you made an error in your judgment. You should not have done this. And you can make that argument very clear. And the more so you, more evidence you put in there, the better that they will be like, well, I guess we just provide coverage or not. So why do I need to do this? My state has trans healthcare protections. This is really unclear for a lot of people, particularly for folks who have, again, self-insured or fully funded plans. You'll see here, um, this is from the uh, Movement Advancement Project, which is one of the organizations that tracks these types of state determinations. Um, there'll be, you know, you'll see explicit laws and you'll see guidance that says, you know, you need to provide coverage in private plans. You'll see it in Medicaid plans. You'll also see this information on the, on the Medicare standpoint, uh, basically saying that because of the ACA, you have to provide care. Uh, and some states have explicit like language that says we're not going to cover anything. And they'll refuse to cover gender affirming care. It's not common. You can see that 
Arkansas is sticking out in that regard, <laughs> um, but it's something to keep in mind. Um, and some laws have only protections based off of the uh, gender, gender expression, gender identity. They, the way they, they put the language in is confusing, but just something to keep in mind that, you know, always check with what your state says. Um, this basically says that the insurance regulators who regulate uh, a plan can decide to have the type of coverage. And so, for example, in New York State, we have a guidance document that was issued by our local insurance department saying that any insurance company that's under their jurisdiction, therefore, has to cover care, but only applies to plans that they regulate. And I'll get into that what that looks like in a second. So there's like, again, different types of insurance plans. There's private insurance, there's Medicare, which is and Medicaid, which are two uh, plans that are publicly funded. Medicare typically for folks who are 65 or older and folks who uh, you know, are disabled and folks who are um, who qualify through other means. Um, Medicaid being a state plan based on an income level. Um, and so you always think about who regulates what. And so in this instance, private insurers typically uh, State departments regulate what's called a fully insured plan, meaning that when someone buys a package for a policy, they don't customize anything from the state, it's regulated by the state and the state insurance department. If they're buying a self-funded plan, which is a plan that is um, the insurer, sorry, me, the employer defines what those benefits are, and the employer's regulation is based on ERISA, which is a, a national plan, and mind you, I'm not an attorney, but ERISA basically, the Department of Labor, Labor has this definition of how benefits work and defines how you can provide benefits. And what's really important is that even self-funded plans, even though they're not under the, self, the fully insured piece by the state, uh, they're still required to provide coverage under Department of Labor determination because there's reasons. The point is, is that even self-funded plans still can't categorically deny care because that's considered job discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, but basically, again, I always tell folks, based on how you're, what kind of plan you have, always look to your state insurance department to being the place that's going to help you with the external appeals. Um, but there are ways in which you can see by looking at your certificate of coverage, what's going to provide coverage. So um, usually in your certificate of coverage, it'll tell you what state it's governed under, and it'll also tell you if it's a self-insured plan. If you have any confusion or if you want me to take a look at your policy, I'm happy to do that for anyone on the call. But I just remind folks that what's really important is that not everyone knows. Always look at your certificate of coverage to see what the possibility is there. But really important here is that just to have an awareness of, of trans protections uh, at the federal level, the ACA 1557, which is non-discrimination clause, uh, that is the overarching one. So basically any, um, any plan that's regulated by a marketplace, any plan that's regulated uh, federally is under the ACA because anything, basically anything that receives federal dollars has to provide coverage. That includes things like um, uh, plans that are done by uh, uh, colleges and universities, it's a really great example, like student health plans, they're all required to provide coverage just on the basis of the fact that because those, those colleges and universities receive funding for Title IX, uh, Title IX, I believe, uh, they're required to provide coverage, something to keep in mind. Uh, and those can be self-funded plans, they can be fully insured plans. Either way, if you receive federal funding, you're technically under this, this domain. Um, the state health protections, basically that's health insurance bulletins, Medicaid regulations, uh, those are per state. Always look at your state's information. Uh, there's also consumer protections, which is the appeals processes, which are also kind of set forth by the ACA. And there's also what's called health parity laws. And basically it says that if you cover one type of health care, you have to provide another. Uh, it's not, even though, you know, gender dysphoria by all means necessary is not a mental health disorder uh, because it's regulated as such. Um, I always tell folks what's really important is that, um, you know, if it's covered for mental health, or if it's covered for physical health, it's covered for mental health and therefore it's covered. Because it's still considered to be a mental health uh, diagnosis because of the DSM, you can basically argue that because of mental health parity laws, you have to provide coverage. It's it's a very backward, strange way of looking at it, but it is helpful. From the standpoint of employment protections, so the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment uh, Opportunity Commission, uh, basically it says that um, because they found that gender affirming care, if you, if you provide an exclusion or you don't provide coverage, it's a, technically a violation of federal law. Um, Basically, you can't discriminate. If your benefits discriminate, you're liable. And so you can file claims cases there. Uh, but also for folks who have been following the Supreme Court cases, uh, the Bostock versus Clayton County, some folks may be familiar with uh, a transgender woman by the name of Amy Stevens, who uh, worked for a funeral home and was denied, uh, basically was, was fired from her job for being trans. And because that was part of this case, uh, which is basically interpreting Title VII, um, which is now just enjoined to include both sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, because of that, I always tell folks that basically it says that because Title VII includes sex and sex includes information about gender identity and transgender status, you are provided coverage. 
Um, there's also disability protection, so the ADA. So in some instances, people consider gender dysphoria, like states, municipalities, insurers, consider gender dysphoria disabling um, condition. It can be for some people, doesn't mean that it is, and that's not universal. There's not been, it's just something to keep in mind, but it's a way you can leverage disability protection saying that you're denying me because I'm, I have this medical, medical condition and therefore that's the case. Most people, you know, a lot of people take offense to that because the idea of, of someone's gender experience to be a medical condition, but it's just a way you can leverage that type of information. Okay, this is a lot and this is a lot of information. Thank you for all for hanging in there. And I know I personally feel this way. I'm feeling overwhelmed and that's real. That is so true because this is overwhelming. Insurance processes aren't meant to enable care. They are meant to pay for care. And because payment is typically regulated and restricted, this is why we deal with this. It's okay to be overwhelmed, but this is all the more reason to reach out to the resources that you know about. People, let everyone that you know, let everyone know that you're having trouble because you know what? You never know who's going to be able to help. And also you never know who's going to be able to provide different types of support to you. So general tips, I say this, you know, some appeals processes can happen in writing, some of them can happen over the phone. Just generally speaking, don't call the insurance agents. I just always recommend get everything in writing. And the reason being is that you can always refer to a document. Uh, you can always basically say like, hey, this person said this to me at this point, and they made this determination, and that's why. You can go back to it, you can reference it, you can basically have a paper trail that says like, this is what you told me, and you can check, you can, you can check them if they uh, have conflicting information. You can say like, well, you said this, and you said that, and you can basically call them out on their nonsense. Um, and you can use that for your, to your advantage. If you have to call, which uh, some people do, and that's the reality of it, I always highly recommend that you ask people the supervisor and you always say like, you know, you ask, and, and various states have, have the um, different thing about recording information. And I'm someone who is someone who's not a fast writer so I, and I have horrible handwriting. So I'm like, hey, is it okay I record this conversation? I just wanna make sure that I get information, I get everything correct. Um, but just take notes about who you spoke with, make sure you're talking to like the number, of, like the time of the call, the date of the call, all the information so that you have a reference point in the event that you have to use that information later saying like you told me this. Um, keep track of your deadlines. Like I said, that 60 day window, 180 day window, always look at your certificate of coverage to show what benefits are there. Um, always write up uh, an appeals process timeline. What that could mean is that like, you know, when certain things are due, when you have to respond to something. And also most importantly, get help when you need it. And I say this, help looks different for everyone, but just don't be afraid to ask. And when I say that, that can be emotional support, that can be logistical support, planning, you name it, calling insurance companies, you know, communicating with a surgeon, working with a health advocate, get help when you need it, because this is overwhelming for so many reasons, and you don't have to do this alone. And getting help can mean a lot of different things. It can mean consumer assistance programs. These are set up by the ACA. A lot of states have them. An example, in New York State, we have consumer health advocates. It's paid for by our tax dollars, so we don't have to pay for that. In my opinion, I don't think English should have to pay an attorney to help them with their case, because the reality is, is that this is something you should be entitled to anyway. But that's not always the case. But these organizations are fantastic. They can also provide help with the process of doing this. Uh, and typically what you need is a denial of care with pre-certification in order to get assistance. So make sure, again, get that pre-certification. Even if it's denial, make sure you get it so they can help you. Legal aid programming, this is mostly for folks at certain income levels, but that's also can help. Uh, there's also transgender legal organizations, the cost, there's some, maybe some cost involved. And also a lot of people reach out to a lot of the lar larger national trans organizations. I don't usually recommend that because they usually do what's called impact litigation, which means they're only gonna take cases that they're able to take. And those are the cases that are gonna have larger implications. So an example being the Gavin Grimm case out of, out of Virginia. Um, I think it's Gavin Grimm v. Gloucester County. And basically that was a case they took on because it was a big impact litigation case. And they don't always have the, the chops to actually handle these cases. These are very nuanced, they are time consuming, and they also require that specification. I also let folks know that private attorneys have significant cost, and so that's why it's not always easy to just hire someone off the bat. Appeals, again, are labor and time intensive process, but that doesn't mean they're worth it because honestly, your care is worth it. Like, I want everyone to get the care that they need. The reality is that sometimes it takes more time to get there than others. And also, Again, you can ask your providers for help, and that means they can help you writing the, ref the surgical uh, referral letters. They can also help you back up your evidence. If they have clinical evidence behind them, they can give you those resources. Um, basically, things that can justify medical necessity. Um, and they can offer to provide arguments uh, that other patients may have successfully used to get coverage. So again, they are your resources. Ask them for help. If they don't offer you help, you might need to find a different provider to provide that assistance. Okay, and self-care, generally speaking, and this is last, but by far not least, recognize that self-advocacy can be emotionally draining, first and foremost. 
um, it's challenging to both balance the appeals process and also deal with the physical and emotional impact of the preparation for surgery. So I you know I speaking from my experience, whenever I've had a situation where I've had to fight an appeals process, I've had to do something, the reality is that that takes away from me taking care of myself. And so keep that in mind. You need to take care of yourself because the reality is that if you didn't have to work, if money were no objects, you would still have to prepare for surgery in some way, shape, or form. And that's emotionally, that's physically, that is, um, you know, all of other factors. So keep that in mind. And most importantly, you are not alone. That is the most important thing because the reality is, is that this makes you feel, this process makes you feel alone. And that's not, that's, that's by design. It's meant to isolate people. It's basically trying to say that, like, you know, it's your specific care that's not been found medical necessary. The reality is, is that you are not alone in this. There are so many people who deal with this and you deserve to get what you need. And so again, mobilize people, friends, colleagues, loved ones who are able to provide help, take them up on their offer and get the resources by checking with the right people. Okay, that was a world run. I'm putting my email back up for folks to see. If you have specific individual questions, I'm happy to answer them and provide local resources where I can. Uh, I know we have very limited time. I'm so sorry. Everyone's been so great in providing information. Uh, I just want to make sure I answer all of the questions that kind of came up that we may not have fully covered. So, so I think we really only have one right at the moment, and and that was if you had any sample letters because this person says that they're horrible at writing letters. So, um, yeah, yeah. So I do have uh, letters that I've written for other people and written for myself. There are no universal letters. Again, it really depends on the type of care that you're trying to get. Um, so, for example, if we're talking about something like. Um, a good example is like body contouring. I have experience with writing those letters. They are not easy to write because there isn't a lot of clinical evidence, but uh, that's when you reach out to your local resources. The other thing too, is that I highly recommend if you're able to reach out to your local advocacy organization, they can help you with that appeal process and help you get the evidence to write the letters itself, uh, let, write the letter itself. Um, and unfortunately, the reality is, is that this is how their process works. It is bureaucratic, it is incredibly classist, and it relies a great deal on people having a certain ability to write these letters. That's not your fault. And let's be real, the insurance company is not looking for um, you to list all the reasons. They're just trying to find a reason to continue denying you the coverage because they can. And so I highly recommend that you work with a legal organization or a local advocacy org that does this work. Uh, in terms of uh, sample letters, um, there's, some there's some pretty good clinical evidence uh, at Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. They have like a whole like series of evidence pieces you can use. Um, you can also always reach out to like start a letter and work with your local provider and say like, hey, like I need to do this. I need some help with this. They can help you review the information. Sometimes people will, will require that you provide extra uh, like, like payment for consulting, move, move on. There are also local LGBT centers that also have some of this experience, but just again, reach out to as many people in your networks. And if not, you can always reach out to me. I'm happy to advise on these pieces. But I always just say like, you know, First and foremost, these things are hard and it's not it's by design. And so if you're overwhelmed, that's okay. Ask for the resources. I'm happy to provide as much as I can. Um, but again, like local organizations, local trans organizations, a lot of them have referrals for folks they've worked with before and they're able to provide that kind of assistance. So I highly recommend you reach out to as many resources as you can and you'd be surprised who what the information turns up. Yeah, you know, I was, I was going to say, so I was going to mention um, Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund as well. So they, they actually have some templates that you can download off of their site and have a, a bunch of resources there. Um, and then, you know, in the Pennsylvania area where, where we are, um, you know, there's the Mazzoni Center that does a lot of great work in this area. Um, there's comprehensive health services in the Lehigh Valley where I'm located that, you um, uh, can provide help in, in those areas. So if you're a patient of, of either of those, for example, they can provide assistance. Um, and then we're able to, you know, often refer people uh, to, you know, organizations that can help with this. But really, and, and I'll just say this because my spouse is a healthcare provider, is that most healthcare providers, you know, they want to try to help in this area. Um, they're also very busy. So, you know, it's, you have to be persistent with them, but they will, you know, and especially these surgeons, right? So they want you as their patient. They want to get the revenue, you know, for doing the work. Um, and they will often, you know, go that extra mile. You just have to be willing to kind of go that extra mile with them, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, completely agree. And I think that that's one of the reasons why when you reach out to your provider and you explain what happened, they may have that resource for you. They may be able to provide those, they may be able to help you with a letter. They may be able to give you the resources that have your clinical evidence, uh, a good example that comes to mind is like breast augmentation surgery, which happens a lot. 
Um, and certain, a lot of insurance companies explicitly exclude uh, breast augmentation in their coverage. And there's a way you can say like, you know, if I were, and I also, since I've worked in medical offices, I work for a healthcare center now, so I know what these things look like, but you know, you can say like, you know, the Endocrine Society has found that uh, after two years, you've maximized your breast growth. And that's really important. Like that kind of information is something that you just may not know because it's not something you work with in every day. And so if you reach out to a provider, local folks, they can provide those resources and direct you to the right place. And it's just, there's just a lot of information that you can potentially use to get your care covered. And even then, like persistence is so important. And that's where the self-care piece comes in. And just remember that, you know, again, these processes are hard by design. Uh, doesn't mean you can still, you still can't fight them. And the reality is, is that the more that we uh, help each other, we can also share that collective wisdom across the people that we care about. Because I can guarantee you of all the friends that I have that I have, have had surgery, they don't do it alone. And that's a reason for that. Yeah. You know, trans folk are amazingly persistent and perseverant, right? And some days you feel like you win by your fingernails and other days you'll make a big leap. And, um, you know, you, you cherish those big leaps and they're kind of what gets you through those days when you're hanging on by your fingernails. So, exactly. you know, Alexander, I want to thank you so much for investing your time. This is an incredibly, you know, complex topic and, um, You've done a great job in sort of outlining it. Would really encourage uh, those who have been on the video, the, uh, the the live session here, to go back, and it'll be on our YouTube channel in a few days. And you know, you can stop and pause and write things down, and and uh, really kind of get the information that you need. So yeah, I also have, yeah, I also have a, a little work, a little like copy of the slides I give to folks too, with all the terminology pieces defined and various resources that can allow you to have that kind of like concentrated information. I can also send that out if uh, if you'd like to distribute that to the folks who registered. Yeah. So if you want to send that to me, we can absolutely make sure that's available for folks. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. And like I said before, you can always reach out to me. I can direct you to eventually the right place. Uh, even if I don't have those resources, I will do my best to get you the people that you're supposed to get in touch with. So okay. feel free to reach out to me. I'll do my best. Just I always tell folks, give me a couple of days because sometimes I have uh, other, other things that are happening. I just want to make sure I can dedicate the time to really meaningfully read email and make sure I can get back to you. Thank you so much, Alexander. It's been wonderful. It's been an honor working with you. The feeling is mutual. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.